Hello. Pare Royal in English, I'm going to speak in English. So, good afternoon. I'm going to speak uh, in English for my friends who came here to listen to me. I will try to be short because we are 10 minutes late. And uh, the point today is to talk about continuous packet recording. You know that uh, packet is the source of evidence of every problem. So, there is a saying that says, you know, packet never lie. So, when you have a packet, you have the proof that something has happened, it has happened on that way. So here, we are talking about how to do this over time. So how to continuously capture packet to disk and to save them like, uh, you know, you are doing with uh, cameras, VCRs, that you put outside of a building just to see what is going on. For what purpose? For security, of course, and for troubleshooting. Troubleshooting means that uh, you have a problem, you want to address this problem, and uh, so you need the packet. Because sometimes the metric, the nice graphs that you see on the screen, are not enough to describe the problem you are experiencing. Just to make this long story short, you know that TCP dump and Wireshark are able to dump packet on disk. This is something that everybody knows, so there is nothing new on this. So why are we here to talk about that? It is because we need to, dis to describe and we need to, to fix this problem at higher speed. So we need to make sure that everything is done properly. If you look at, uh, at Wireshark, for instance, uh, and I have highlighted in these three uh, red boxes what you have to do. First of all, you select the network interface. Second, you can specify, eventually, a capsule filter so that you can dump a specific packet to this, those that you're only interested in. And then at the end, you have, at the bottom of the screen, the ability to write those packets to disk. So in essence, we have all, all that. So why do we need something special for that? Uh, and in Wireshark, you also have the ability of uh, highlighting the packet. So you know what is going on. You are able to analyze the packet. You are able even to see at the bottom of the screen the packet in binary. So isn't this enough? Unfortunately, it is not enough. First of all, we need a continuous packet recording. Continuous means like a surveillance camera. So you have to put something in one place in your company and this has to write packet to disk all the time. Because if you have a problem, you don't know when the problem happens. You know just that a problem has happened when you see a spike or when you have received an alarm. But when you see the alarm, the, it is too late because the problem has happened before. So this is the reason why you need continuous. So all the time, permanently, 24 by 7. This is the, this is the buzzword. And also, we need to make sure that uh, we are always writing packet to disk, like a surveillance camera. So therefore, you allocate a space on your disk, and you start writing. And then at some point, when you, are, you have filled up the space, you go back at the beginning, and you overwrite the oldest file, similar to what, uh, what happens in security. So in essence, what we need here is to provide evidence. So we need the packet that is showing us the problem. This is because sometimes there are questions about that. So sometimes you see that there is a spike, or sometimes you see that there is something wrong. People are accusing each other, but they don't have a proof. Like I said, pockets never lie, so you need a pocket. And also there is another problem, that many people have deployed over the years a firewall. So firewall are pretty common in organizations. But other people have also added over time an IDS, an intrusion detection system. But the intrusion detection system reports you a warning, reports you an error, reports you an information, but does not give you evidence of the problem. So if you have in your company information leakage, so if somebody is sending out information that was not supposed to be sent out, it means that there is a problem. So you also want to see what kind of information has been sent out of your company. Or if you want to see uh, that there is a real problem, you really have to pinpoint the problem and go back to the pocket. So you need the pocket. So in essence, uh, this is the problem. Now the, fun, the funny part starts. Okay, problem number one. Pocket shuffling is not an option. What Wireshark and other tools are doing, they are sitting on top of the operating system. The operating system, it is trying to achieve best of the performance by maximizing the utilization of every individual core of your system. And the same happens on the network adapter. So it means that the packet you receive, they are not guaranteed to be on the same order as the order that has been observed on the network. So it means that the packet you see, they are probably not the same packet that have been sent on the network. Okay, at the end, they are but they are not in the same order. So this is the, fir the first problem. We have to make sure that this problem does not occur. And uh, Wireshark or TCP dump do not guarantee you that at all. 
The second problem is the speed. So you know that uh, 10 gigabit is kind of common these days. So with 10 gigabit, you basically are able to interconnect uh, uh, switches. But other people are moving to 40 or to 100G eventually. So it means that you have to capture this data. So capturing at the edge of the network, so capturing next to your server, might not be an option because you might need several devices, several ports, because each server is connected with two, three, four ports just for load balancing or for redundancy or for fault tolerance. So you need to connect and to, to capture at the switch, but the switch is picking 10G. So you need the 10 gigabit to disk, okay? Even though you are saving to disk a portion of this traffic. Just to give you an idea of the disk space, at 10 gigabit, you are writing to this 1.25 gigabyte per second. So it means that with 4 terabytes, you, 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 you can do one hour at most. So it means that a 40G, that is a kind of common speed uh, these days for interconnecting the switches, you know, you see you need over 17 terabytes per, per hour in order to do that. So if you want to keep a history, it means that you can save just the last part of the, of the, the packet. And we cannot drop any packet. This is, this is very important. So the netto speed is a problem. For this space, you know, that we can save a little bit of, uh, of traffic, but, uh, you know, is packet compression an option? If you're, using, uh, if you're used to save internet traffic, it is not really helping. So have a look at it. So if, you, if you're moving data on the internet, most of the time the data is already compressed. If you're watching a YouTube video, YouTube is compressed. If you're moving a picture, the picture is compressed. So what can you do? And in order to compress data, you have to put information in sequence, whereas packets are shuffled on the network. So compression is helping, but not too much on the internet. Inside a network organization, it's another story because you have a lot of textual information, for instance, a SQL request, a response with a lot of records, this can be very easily compressed. So compression can help depending on where you are. So if you are saving from you to the internet or if you are inside a certain organization, of course, it can, it can help. But uh, everything said, you know, for 10 gigabit you need at least 10 drives, for 40G you need at least 32 drives, because even if you compress data, you cannot squeeze too much. This is very important. This is a, a message I want to give you. So somebody might say, okay, let's drop some traffic. Let's filter the traffic we are not interested in. Good and bad idea at the same time, because if you filter traffic, you are restricting the view to the traffic you care about. But if you restrict yourself to this traffic, you are basically dropping all the rest. And sometimes the problem happens when you have a traffic spike, and the traffic spike might not be caused by you, but might cause to other traffic that is flowing onto the same wire. So, Filtering traffic is a good idea, but you have to be careful doing that because if you're filtering traffic, then it means that you might not understand the reason why you have a packet drop, just because it is not your fault, but because other traffic that was sent on the same wire has caused the packet drop. So there are other interesting techniques that uh, can be applied. The first technique is packet slicing. Packet slicing is the ability to cut a packet up to a certain length, depending on the importance of the packet. So you can say, for, for packet I care about, I would like to see the whole packet, okay, because I want to reconstruct the session. For packet I care less, I want to save them up to a snap length, or let's say 100 bytes or even less. So this would allow me to dump packet to disk, dump my traffic, full packet size, so I can fully reconstruct session, but at the same time I can have a, a space uh, preserved just because I'm not dr driving uh, my disk crazy because I'm not saving everything. So packet likes can be very, very helpful. So just to make the long story short, we have created a, uh, an application called N2Disk that it is able to do all of this I've shown you so far. This application is able to capture from one or more network adapters to receive packet to, to dump them onto the same order that have been received, to slice them up to a certain slap length or to slice them dynamically. The, this application guarantees you to that because it's sitting on top of our driver technology that uh, is, uh, is basically uh, passing all the kernel uh, infrastructure. And uh, therefore, we are sitting on top of it. We are, we are using uh, the multi-core technology to spread you know, the, the, the load across multiple cores, but the, the, the application, namely the core that is doing packet capture is one. So it means that the packet are saved in the same order as are being received. We have the ability of indexing packets because, as you know, with a pickup, uh, the, the main problem is that if you open it with Wireshark, you have to read one packet after the other, whereas you would like to go up to a specific packet. And this is a big problem because you cannot wait 10 minutes to see your packet just because the packet has been received you know, uh, after other packets. You won't go directly to the point. So this is why 
packet indexes is important. Another thing that N2Disk is doing, it is the ability of creating an index. So this index uh, is divided in two pieces. The first part, it's, uh, it's a hash in essence that allows you to say if a certain packet you're searching, it is contained on a pickup or not. So it means that uh, if you are saving data continuously, we can immediately select those pickup files that are likely to contain your packet. And then using the index, we go directly to the packet onto the pickup file without having to, to do anything else but going directly. So it's not that we have to scan. Go, uh, avoiding the scan, it is very important because you're writing to disk and at the same time you are reading from disk. So it is very important to avoid any action that is not necessary. Uh, something I would like to stress here is that everything is compressed, so the data is compressed. And uh, unli unlikely uh, uh, with tools such as zip or gz, where you have to decompress everything, uh, N2Disk allows you to decompress only in portion of the file. So it means that whenever you have to go to the portion of the file you're interested in, you will decompress the, the part of the packet and then extract what you care about and that's it. So everything is done automatically. So you don't see anything. Everything is hidden behind the scenes here. So it's the tool that is doing that automatically for you. So it means you are saving this space. It means that you, you, you don't need as many drives as you would need just because we are reducing the disk space used. So in essence, a compression rate, like I said, on the internet is, is very little. It can be 5 to 6%. But if you are in a LAN, uh, very likely you will put these appliances in your LAN or next to, to your border gateway just for selected protocols, such as, for instance, HTTP or email, it is very easy to compress. You can achieve very high compression rates. And what I want to say is that everything I described today happens on the fly. So it means that the packets are received, are compressed in memory, exploiting the latest innovation on, of the processor by Intel, so we can compress them and write them to disk once. So not we write, we read, we compress, we save, everything is done once. Because otherwise we are not able to, to achieve the speed, especially at uh, multi 10 gigabit. And to this allows you to create uh, something we call timeline. So unlikely to, to, to tools such as TCP dump, where we have one dot pickup, two dot pickup, three dot pickup. Here you can search based on time. You can say Monday last week, I want to search one packet that has sent, be sent my computer to another computer over port 85. This is something that we can easily do. So the timeline is very important because it creates a time structure to packets that don't have a time structure, I mean the pickup file per se, okay? And the searching packets can also be combined with other activities. Just to make an example, if you have a device that is writing to disk, okay, you need one device, but it might be that you also want to run your IDS. You don't want to buy two machines, so you want to do everything with one machine. So we have other tools that are part of the, the PF Ring infrastructure that we have described a couple of years ago that allow us to take the same packet and to spread the packet across different applications. So we can send the same packet in zero copy, so it means that uh, we don't have to copy the packet and then to uh, use uh, memory or bandwidth, but everything is done in, in, magically by, by uh, our tools that are not copying packet at all but just passing references to one application, such as N2Disk, to your application that is doing something extra, or to another application, such as NProbe, that is writing and creating your flows to disk. Just to make a simple example, you take one box, you put our balancer application that is open source, so you can download from our website, and you take one ingress device, so one Ethernet port, you receive the packet, you send the same packet at the same time to Snort or to Suricata, so you generate your alerts, and the same packet is sent to N2Disk. So you have the alert on Suricata, you have the time when the problem has happened, and you can search on the pickup file what has happened, so you can have evidence of your problem. You can go to uh, your colleague and say, hey, this is the problem, and this is the proof, okay? So you don't have the feeling that something bad has happened, but you can control yourself, the source of the problem, because on the same box, you can do two things in parallel. This is very important. And the load balancing and everything is implemented in software, so you don't need to buy costly hardware. Just to complete the set, of, the set of features, so we are able to do, of course, uh, 10 gigabit or multi 10 gigabit. I explain you why it is important, even though you might need just one. We are able to do selective packet slicing, just to you know, write a packet to disk only for the portion we are interested in. We are able to do everything on the fly. So everything happens while capturing. It's not a post-processing activity. So as soon as you receive the traffic, the traffic is written on disk, so it is immediately available in a compressed form. And of course, because our software is, uh, is sitting on top of the open source part of uh, PFRing, all the tools, companion tools, such as 
Wireshark, for instance, are able to open compressed pickup files that we are saving and decompress them on the fly. So it means that uh, you don't have to do a sort of G and zip of the pickup before you run Wireshark. But Wireshark can read the packet immediately, or you can search for packets using our web GUI. Of course, there is another application that, uh, that is, is companion to it. So we have N2Disk, we have disk 2 n disk 2 n is the application that is able to do the opposite. So namely to take multiple pickup files and reproduce them on the disk at that line rate or at the same speed as the problem has been, uh, as the packet has been saved. So just to make a simple example, so most of you have a remote location. So, so for, suppose that your company has opened a branch, I don't know, in Eastern Europe, and they have a problem and you want to see what has happened, what you can do is that you can create a box with the software, ship the box to the remote location, the box will dump your traffic to disk, and then you can bring the, the, the box back to your home location and analyze it. How can you do that? You can look at the packet, or you can turn the box into a traffic replay application. So you simply have an egress port of your box and that is sending the same packet that has been written on disk at the remote location and the packets are replayed with the same speed, exactly the same speed. One case example of uh, this 2 n is uh, the Fox television. So they are using our software to write the 4K television program to disk and to reproduce them later on. So we have to be very precise. And in our case, the precision is very high. It's about 100 microseconds of, of uh, uh, precision. Of course, everything is done through a web GUI. If you are happy with, uh, with a shell, you can use the web shell. The shell, otherwise, you can use this uh, open source uh, uh, application we have written that is called the Mbox, that is basically a web GUI that allows you to do everything. So if you want to extract a packet, you simply click on the calendar. I want to see a packet from this host to this host on this day. Click extract. And when the packet has been extracted, you receive a notification on the screen that says, okay, your pickup is now ready to use. So something very simple. Uh, something very easy to use for everybody. Of course, you can control your memory, your storage, everything is shown to you without a shell. Uh, if you're interested to try the software, it, is, it has been integrated on one product uh, of Virt Phoenix or the Virt Phoenix recorder. So in essence, uh, you're able to use this software into uh, this, this product that allows you to, to capture traffic to this and to visualize the traffic and of course to integrate it with uh, NetEye and, and other tools. So in essence, you can have evidence of the problem with uh, N2Disk and at the same time you can have Nagios or another tool send you the alert and you can correlate the alert with the packets that are really uh, being captured on disk. So just to wrap up, PFD, PFRing is the base of our technology. It's the open source technology you already know, I assume. So today I presented N2Disk and N, the two companion applications, one for taking packets and read, writing them to disk, and the other one for reading from disk and emitting them on a wire. They are able to, to solve one problem, very common problem, to have evidence. So we are solving the problem in a way so that it can be proved that a problem has happened in a certain term. No packet shuffling, no packet drops at 10 or multi 10 gigabit. This is very important. We save this space as much as possible. We can compress packets on the fly. We can slice packets, we can filter packets. All happens in real time while capturing. This technology, I think it is very important. It is a very uh, important companion uh, technology that allows you to combine your traditional analysis tools with this in a sort of, a sort of video uh, recording for the network. You put it in one place, you can forget it, but if something bad happens, you come back in time and see what has happened from the packet point of view. Thank you very much. First of all, congratulations for the speed. You recovered 10 minutes I of the coffee break. The, the translator will not be happy, but uh, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> Any questions? No questions? Yes, there is one. No question, actually. Good morning. Eh, volevo tanto chiedere se c'è la possibilità di correlare il traffico registrato con dati ad esempio riguardanti la porta dello switch dal quale è entrato il traffico di rete nel senso che il tipico esempio se ho un'intrusione um, un ad esempio attraverso la wifi potrei voler vedere quale access point ha generato da quale access point è partita l'intrusione o se qualcuno si è attaccato alla rete emulando MAC address e indirizzi IP certamente allora, se noi mettiamo lo strumento su una porta fisica, questo è possibile ovviamente farlo, però il problema è cercare di metterlo al centro. Quindi ci sono due possibilità. 
o ci fidiamo dei McAdres, cosa che però in questo caso mi sembra non sia il caso, oppure dobbiamo usare un, un qualcosa che mi dia il port mirror in maniera intelligente. Per esempio ci sono dei tool, eh, ci sono delle ditte come Apicon o Gigamon o altri, altre ditte com come queste, che dentro il pacchetto non mi mettono solamente il pacchetto, ma mi aggiungono delle informazioni extra. Per esempio mi aggiungono il timestamp o per esempio mi aggiungono la porta. In questo caso qui, nel pacchetto, leggermente steso, quindi ho delle informazioni in più, io posso risalire alla porta di origine e quindi posso essere certo che in questo caso, se qualcuno mi emula un MAC address, io so da quale porta fisicamente mi è arrivato. Quindi sì, ci vuole diciamo, chi ci fornisce il traffico che sia configurato in questa maniera. Non, non ci serve un port span, diciamo, via, per standard, ci vuole qualcosina in più. Comunque è possibile, sì. Sì, in sostanza che cosa succede? In una rete, anche in uno switch ci avrete non so quante porte, ok? E queste porte in qualche maniera devono essere mirrorate. Ecco, invece di fare questo mestiere qua usando uno switch normale, cioè quando lo comprate, ricordatevi, se la cosa vi interessa, di verificare che ci sia questa caratteristica. E quindi diciamo, i pacchetti vengono estesi. Non è una tecnologia standard, cioè ogni costruttore ci mette un'estensione più o meno come gli pare allora. Xia ci mette la sua, eh, Gigamon ci mette la sua. Questo non è importante, noi riusciamo a gestirle. Una cosa che non vi ho detto è, per esempio, le estensioni X sono gestite tranquillamente, quindi possiamo dirvi anche queste cose in più. Ecco, questa qui è una cosa abbastanza comune sui prodotti moderni, su quelli di due anni fa o dell'anno scorso iniziava a esserci. Perché è una cosa importante? Perché un'altra cosa importante che non ho detto oggi è il timestamp. Cioè il, il timestamp ce lo mettiamo noi nel software, però diciamo, siccome il timestamp in sostanza ce lo dovrebbe mettere la rete, questi apparati, oltre a darmi il pacchetto e la porta, riescono a darmi anche il timestamp che è stato diciamo, condiviso tra le macchine con un protocollo chiamato PTP. Quindi sì, sono apparecchi di rete abbastanza comuni, l'importante è che quando li comprate vi assicuriate che ci sia questa caratteristica dentro. Eh. Nessuna altra domanda? No other questions? Unless you have one. Huh? Unless you have one. No, have to. Okay, <laughs> coffee time. Thank you. <laughs>